How did this become this? Syria is the crisis of our generation. Over 100,000 dead, half the country forced from its home, and perhaps hardest to believe, a crisis now entering its fourth year. Did you ever think that we would be in something this bad for this long? No. I mean, if I'd been here with you three years ago and I'd have said nine million people displaced from their homes, three million in neighboring countries, 130,000 dead, 1,500 kids assassinated by snipers and victims of government prisons, you'd have said there'll be an overwhelming sense that that is just a return to the dark ages and something that isn't uh, acceptable in the 21st century. And I think it is shocking that we've reached this stage a war without limit, seemingly a war without end, and a war without law. Because every day, as we are doing this interview, international humanitarian law is being broken, and the progress of certainly the last 60 years since the Second World War in establishing norms of war that protect civilians is, is being rolled back. And why do you think it has been, in your words, acceptable? I think that what's happened is that the political divisions between the great powers as well as the regional powers, between Russia and the US, as well as between Iran and Saudi Arabia, those political divisions have infected the humanitarian dialogue. I have to be very, very careful about the extent to which I can speculate about the wisdom or otherwise of military uh, engagement. What I think this has become is the defining collective failure of this century so far. We all remember Rwanda of the 90s, we all rem remember Bosnia. The cities of Syria, the Aleppos, the Homs, are going to go down alongside the Sarajevos in a terrible litany. One of the greatest blocks to intervention has been Russia, in the form of a leader who's not relinquished power for nearly 15 years, indeed has been exerting it in Ukraine as we speak. Looking back, did they have too strong a hand? I think that they made a bet that has proved to be correct, which is that Assad, uh, President Assad had more uh, going for him than many thought. They, they bet that he wouldn't fall in the way that President Mubarak uh, did, and they proved to be right. Has the USA, the EU, been too supine when it comes to Putin? I think that it's, look, the narrative in America I mean, is uh, an attack on President Obama for being too weak. That's, that's the narrative that's around there. What I see is something slightly different because there isn't a military response in the Crimea. And if you mean by strong, he should have had a military response in Crimea, I think uh, no one would seriously uh, say that. What I see is something different, not a sort of strong, weak uh, spectrum, but something different, a fragmented international community. Future generations might not take this idea of fragmentation. They might just say, why was Russia so readily indulged for so long? Well, I think that, I don't think it's indulgence is uh, the right thing because there's a lot of fury. Um, the question is, the point about the fragmentation is that it's only economic unity that actually is the root to pressure. The thing about dealing I found with working with the Russian government is that they want respect, but they respect strength. So if it's all about the economy, stupid, and hitting Russia where it hurts, how are we doing on sanctions here? David Miliband offers a stark warning to this government. Uh, there's a danger that people want a quick fix, and there isn't a quick fix. This is a long game. And one of my reflections on being in the States, looking back here, thinking about American politics, is that the premium on short-term economics can drive out the long-term political strategy. Whereas actually what you need is a long-term economic strategy to back the long-term political strategy. So when it was made clear uh, that David Cameron said he wouldn't hit um, Russians, for example, in the city of London. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's not my place to, to say, but it's an obvious, it, when I talked about fragmentation uh, of the international response, if every country is just thinking, how do we defend our own patch, not, how are we going to unify so that we're presenting a common front, then obviously it's much more difficult to be taken seriously. Should military intervention happen in Syria, as it did in Iraq under the government in which he served? He's loath to say. But when I ask him why he thinks it never happened, the answer's stark. I think that it's obvious there's a post-Iraq, post-Afghanistan, actually also post-financial crisis uh, situation in Western countries where the limits of military power have been widely demonstrated the 
uh, economic constraints, the economic austerity is very clear. And look, the phrase is, that's used in America is nation building at home. Limits of military power means Iraq, Afghanistan didn't work. Well, the, I mean, we're, uh, I see all of this now through the lens of the work we do. We work in 3,800 Afghan villages and we've just done a survey of our staff and the people who they work with. And what they tell me is that they're worried that the gains they've made won't be preserved. I'm being told to rap, but on the day the leader of the opposition, yes, his brother, is making a speech on Europe ruling out a referendum in 2017, it seems rude to go without asking what he thinks of it. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's sensible because Britain has a recovery to build and the central task for the next government is obviously to build that recovery and the idea that halfway through the parliament there would be a, a referendum I don't think that's I don't think many people think 2017 when you've got a German election a French election um, no I think I think what he's done is sensible and statesmanlike and and, and really right